Well, welcome to Lester Elin's uh, Bible study. We're starting, as you know, a new series on the subject of faith. Just going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. For in your word we find the way of salvation, we find instruction for our lives, we find guidance, we find blessing. And we ask, O oh God, that you'll just bless this series of studies on faith to each heart that will listen to it. We pray, O oh God, that our faith will grow. We ask for an increase in faith, that you might grant to us great faith, and know that we might do mighty exploits for you. So speak to us, we ask, through this, your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, why Bible studies on faith? And it's because faith is vital to the Christian life. Uh, there's apparently 245 references to faith in the New Testament. Uh, and there's also 27 references in the New Testament to a, a similar word, which is trust. And in the Old Testament, apparently there's 109 references to either faith or trust. And faith is vital in every aspect of a believer's life. Faith is needed to begin the Christian life. Faith is needed to walk the Christian life. Faith is needed to be an overcomer. Faith is needed to receive the blessings and promises of God. Faith is needed to do mighty exploits for God. Faith is vital for every area of a person's Christian life. And tonight I just want to lay some basic foundations. I want to look at the importance of faith, the object of our faith, a definition of faith, the origin of faith, and faith as a body of belief. So the first thing I want to speak about is the importance of faith. You turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Reading from... Uh, the King James, it says, but without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And as believers, I assume that it's a given that we want to please God, that we want to please our Lord and Saviour. And faith, we read there, is necessary to please God. It says, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. But what does it mean? And how do we please God? Well, the setting or context, context of that verse is quite interesting. If you read the verse before it, Hebrews uh, 11 and verse 5, we read, By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. Now we read about Enoch 
in Genesis chapter 5. If you turn to Genesis chapter 5, for the most part, it's quite a depressing chapter. <laughs> I'm just I'm not going to read all of it, but you'll get the you'll get the sense as we read it. Genesis chapter five. Beginning to read at verse 3, we read, And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were eight hundred years, and he begot sons and daughters, and all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died. And Seth lived a hundred and five years, and begot Enos. And Seth lived after he begot Enos eight hundred and seven years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were nine hundred and twelve years, and he died. And Enos lived ninety years and begot Canaan. And Enos lived after he begot Canaan eight hundred and fifteen years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos were nine hundred and five years. And he died. Jumping down to verse 18, we read, And Jared lived a hundred and sixty-two years, and he begot Enoch. And Jared lived after he begot Enoch eight hundred years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were nine hundred and sixty and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And Methuselah lived a hundred and eighty and seven years and begat Lamech and Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech seven hundred and eighty and two years, and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Methuselah were nine hundred and sixty and nine years, and he died. The grim consequences of the fall into sin is laid bare in this chapter, because you get the repeated refrain, and he died. One exception. One exception in that chapter. If you read the old chapter, there's just one exception, and that's Enoch. And it says that Enoch walked with God, so God took him, translated him without death straight into heaven, like he did with Elijah. In a chapter full of death, God revealed the hope of eternal life. Now you may know that the Old Testament is actually written in Hebrew and Aramaic. And the Hebrew translation of Genesis 5 verse 24 is what we read, Enoch walked with God. But the writer to the Hebrews, if you turn back to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5, he does not use the Hebrew translation, but he uses the Greek translation of the Old Testament text. And the Greek translate the Hebrew text of Enoch walk with God with what we read in Hebrews chapter 5, that Enoch pleased God. The writer to the Hebrews chose to use the Greek translation of the Old Testament to tell us that Enoch pleased God. And Enoch pleased God because he walked with God. What does it mean to walk with God? To walk with someone, you've got to be going in the same direction. I don't know if you've met someone coming that way, and you're coming this way, and you have a little chat, and then you carry on your way. You're not walking with that person. To walk with someone, you've got to walk 
in the same direction. You've got to walk at the same speed. When me and uh, Debbie first started seeing each other, I had to slow down. <laughs> because I walked a little bit quicker <laughs> than Debbie. We have, you have to walk at the same speed if you're going to walk with somebody. And thirdly, you have to have the same destination. If you're not going to the same place, at some point you will part company. And we will look a bit later at what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. But Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God because he walked with God. Of course, the supreme example of what it means to please God is the Lord Jesus Christ. We read at his baptism in Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, reading verses 13 to 17, Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, that heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> Jesus came with a mission, didn't he? And part of that mission was to live a sinful life, a sinless life, not a sinful life, <laughs> a sinless life. He came to fulfill all the law. And here, although John initially didn't want to baptize him, Jesus said it was necessary in order to fulfill all righteousness. And then we get this message from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And as we read through the Gospels on a number of occasions, we read that Jesus came to fulfill the wishes of his Father. And in order to please God, we need to follow his example. For example, in John chapter 4 and 34, Jesus said unto his disciples, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And again in John, the next chapter, it says, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which who has sent me. And we need to follow Jesus' example. In order to please God, like Enoch, we must walk with God and we must do the will of God because this is pleasing to him. So it's important as Hebrew says, without faith we cannot please God. And as I said at the beginning, I'm assuming as Christians we want to please God. But that is our aim, our goal as a Christian. Secondly, I want to speak about the object of our faith. The second part of our text from Hebrews 11 and verse 6 makes clear to us that the object of our faith is a belief in God. Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says, For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Without a belief in God, there is no object of 
the Christian faith. We must believe that God exists and that what he has revealed about himself in creation and in his word and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and by his spirit is true. He is a God of infinite perfection. He subsists in three persons, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is all-seeing. He is the creator of the universe. He is the sustainer of the universe. This is the object of our faith. You turn to Psalm 135. That psalm speaks about God and tells us some wonderful truths concerning the object of our faith, Almighty God. Psalm 135, beginning to read at verse 3. I'm going to read from 3 down to 13, but I'm going to um, stop at verses as we go through. Psalm 135 and verse 3. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name. For it is pleasant. The first thing this psalm tells us is that God is good. God is good. And not only is God good, he is worthy of our praise. Because our God, we read in the Word, only gives good gifts to his children. Every good gift, says in James, I think, comes from the Father in heaven. And he is worthy of our praise. In verse 4 it says, For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Our God chose Israel from all the nations of the world to be the nation from which the Messiah would come. It would be the nation that would be entrusted with the word of God. They are the people of God, are a chosen people. And when we get to the New Testament, we read that we are chosen people. Keep your hand in Psalms. I'm just going to read a verse from John 15 and verse 16. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. John 15 and verse 16. Jesus says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it unto you. The people of God are a chosen people. Whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, Jesus says there, I have chosen you and have appointed you to bear fruit. Another reason to give him praise because of our salvation. Back to Psalm 135, <clears throat> verses 5 and 6. It says, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord please, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas, and in all the deep places. As we mentioned, our God is all-powerful, and nothing can stay his hand. And in this verse we read, God fully accomplishes all that he wills, because no one can frustrate his power. He is Lord above all gods. And whatever the Lord please, he does it in heaven, in earth, in the seas, and in all the deep places. There's nowhere where his sovereignty does not reign. This is our God, the object of our faith. Verse 7, it says, He causeth the vapours to ascend, ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind 
out of his treasuries. God's power extends to the natural world. The weather is under his command. Remember Jesus, he stilled the storm and the disciples were shocked, but the winds and the waves obey him. We heard on Sunday from Dave about King Canute. He could not withstand the tide. Man is powerless when it comes to nature, but here we read that God rules over the natural world and over nature. Verse 8 to 11, speaking about God still, it says, Who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast, who sent tokens and wonders in the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants, who smote great nations and slew mighty kings, Sion the king of the Amorites, and Og king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. Our God is mighty. He is able to deliver his people. He delivered the nation of Israel out of captivity in Egypt and as they were travelling he defeated two kings that we read of there, Sihon of the Amorites and Hog the king of Bashan. Because our God is a mighty God and he will fight for his people. Verse 12 And he gave their land for an inheritance, an inheritance unto Israel, his people. That reminds us that our God is a God who keeps his promises. I don't know if anybody's got the NIV version, but if they could, could they read Joshua 23 and verse 14? Joshua 23 and verse 14. In the King James Version, it says this, And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. This is Joshua speaking. And you know in all your hearts, in all your souls, that not one thing failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Someone like to read it in the NIV? Now I am doing... It's just I like the new t- the NIV translation. Not one of the promises of God has failed. Not one of the promises. What God promised to Israel, he will carry out. What God promises to us in his word, he will fulfill. Verse 13 says, Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever, and thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. God's name and God's ways will last forever. This is our God. This is our God. There's just some of the things that we read in just one psalm, not the entire psalm, concerning the greatness of our God. And that is the one in whom our faith resides. Not in man, but in God. And there is nothing our God cannot do. There is nothing that is outside of his control. We know in Scripture that all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So we've looked at the importance of faith. We've looked at the object of faith. We want to look at a definition. Back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 We get a definition of faith in verse 1. 
It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And this definition of faith has two parts. Firstly, the statement, faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's the first part of the definition. Faith and hope go together, often in the Word of God. And it means a firm persuasion and confidence that God will perform all that he has promised us in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. It says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him are men unto the glory of God by us. And just as we read in the Old Testament from Joshua, our God fulfilled all the promises to the nation of Israel and to Joshua, so we get here in the New Testament the same promise, if you like, that all that we've promised, been promised in Christ Jesus, will come to pass. As the Scripture says, for all the promises of God, in him are yea, and in him are men. And it's all to the glory of God. And Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So our faith and our hope is in Christ Jesus and the promises that he has made. And he has promised to pour out upon his people every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. This is our God. And the second part of the definition it is the substance of things hoped for. And it goes on to say, the evidence of things not seen. Faith convinces the heart and the mind of the reality of those things not seen by the physical eye. I'll say it now again. Faith convinces our hearts and our minds of the reality of things that we have not seen by our physical eyes. You see, we believe in a risen Christ. Have we seen a risen Christ? So we believe in something that we have not seen with our physical eyes. We believe the eyewitness reports that have been come through the Bible, through the people who saw Christ and has written down what he did, the miracles he did, and the fact that he was crucified and was raised again. And our faith is built on something that we have not seen, but the testimony of the apostles and disciples and Christians down through the centuries. It's based on the fact that if, if Christ had not died, sorry, if Christ had died and not risen, then the Romans would have surely produced the body. And Christianity would have been strangled at birth. If Christ had not risen from the dead, then the enemies of Christ surely would have put a stop to Christianity right before it was ever birthed. But of course they couldn't. They couldn't deny the reality of the risen Christ. We have not seen heaven. But we believe there is a heaven. We also believe there is a hell. A heaven to gain and a hell to avoid. And we believe it because the word of God tells us that there is a place called heaven 
and a place called hell. And that believers will one day go to be with the Lord. He's gone to prepare a place for us. Our faith is built on something we cannot see with our physical eye. And it's not unusual. We do that in the natural. We do that in the natural. We cannot see the air that we breathe. But we know it exists. Otherwise, we'd die from a shortage of breath. We believe in the skill of the medical profession. As you know, I'm going to have an operation. I haven't actually asked the consultant <laughs> for a copy of his certificates. You know, I haven't, um, I have assumed <laughs> that he is competent <laughs> to perform this operation. But we do it. We go to the medical profession, don't we? And they say, well, this is what's wrong with you. You need this treatment. And we put our faith in something that we have not seen. Don't you have ever flown? But you don't go up to the pilot, do you? And say, well, can you tell me, is this, how many times have you flown? <laughs> can you show me your log? We accept by faith that he's been trained and qualified to fly. And as pastor often says, as in the natural, so in the spiritual. We put our faith, we put our faith, our hearts and minds in the word of God and what it says. And if we put our faith and trust in natural things, whether it's a medical profession, whether it's a pilot or any other example you can think of, how much more should we put our trust and our faith in Almighty God? Charles Spurgeon, who was a Baptist minister in the 19th century in London. He had a large congregation. He says, faith consists of three essential ingredients. The first ingredient is knowledge. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 and 14 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You see, people cannot believe the gospel until they hear the gospel. You cannot believe the gospel until you hear the gospel. In this instance, ignorance is not bliss. Until someone comes and tells them the good news concerning Jesus Christ, concerning God, and concerning how we can be saved by putting our faith and trust in what he did on the cross. Faith must have knowledge. Something to grasp hold of. The second element of faith is belief. Not only must they hear, but the mind and the heart must work together to believe the things that are spoken of concerning Jesus and his gospel. We read that John, the Apostle John, wrote his gospel and his epistle with one purpose in mind. You turn to John chapter 20. John tells us why he's written his gospel. John 20, verse 30 and 31, it says, 
and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And he says a similar thing in his epistle. You turn to the first epistle of John, chapter 5. The first epistle of John, chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 11 to 13. 1 John 5, 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that you believe on the name of the Son of God, and that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. John wrote his epistle and his uh, gospel with that aim in mind, that people might know with a certainty that the things written are true and worthy of our belief. And the third ingredient of faith, according to Spurgeon, was trust. Knowledge, belief and trust. The saints of old used to have a word to explain trust that we don't use at all, I don't think, now in the UK. You probably, I don't know if you've ever heard of this word, but the word is recumbency. Recumbency. And what it means, it means to lean upon something with all your weight. Better not lean too hard. <laughs> Feels a bit shaky. It means to lean upon someone or something with all your weight. So that they have got you. They're upholding you, if you like. Recumbency. You are leaning on them. And in faith, the trust, we lean upon Christ and what he's done on the cross. We lean upon the word of God and the promises of God. And we stand on those. And we live our life according to those. We lean upon the rock of ages that God cannot change. As Peter tells us, we can cast all our care on him because he cares for us. Our Proverbs, a well-known verse, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. We need not to lean on our own understanding, but on God's word. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. Fourthly, the origin of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Romans 10 and verse 17, a verse that you probably know quite well, says that so faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And John 1 verse 14 reminds us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The origin of our faith is the word of God. And Jesus is the embodiment of the Word of God. He is the Word made flesh. Jesus is both the author and the finisher of our faith. If you look up 
or think about the word author, if you're like me, you probably think of someone who writes a book. That's the first thought that would go through my mind, is an author is the writer of a book. But the word, if you look in a theosaurus, has got many different meanings. It can mean creator, designer, founder, initiator, maker, planner, prime mover, producer. And Jesus is the one who is the author of our faith. For we read, don't we, for it it is by grace we are saved, through faith, and that not of yourself, what? It is a gift of God, because he is the author of it. He is the originator of it. And Jesus has opened up a new and living way for us to enter into the presence of God. He is the author of our faith. He's also the finisher of our faith. The word used in the Hebrews is a word from teleos, if I pronounced it correctly. And that can mean complete, mature, perfection. He is the finisher. He is the one that will bring our faith to completion. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, that's what it says. Philippians 1 and verse 6, Jesus, uh, Paul writing to the Philippians says this, being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Meaning that he will keep us. He will keep us to the end because he is the finisher as well as the author of our faith. We are kept by the power of God. And what God commences, he will bring to fruition. For who can oppose God? He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the word of God. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. And lastly, faith can also mean a body of belief. A body of belief. In Jude, which is the second to last book of the New Testament, just one chapter, we read an expression that we are to earnestly contend for the faith. It says in Jude 1 and verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. don't know if you watched the coronation, but our king and for him, our queen, is the defender of the faith. The defender of the faith, which means a body of belief. The Church of England has a statement of faith. It's known as the 39 Articles. It's quite a a good statement of faith. The sad thing is, most of the people in the Church of England no longer believe it. But we're to earnestly contend for the faith. That is the body of truth and sound doctrine which we are called to defend from error. Fundamental truths. Truth about Jesus, about salvation, about God. And it's to defend the church from errors. The church, the Bible warns against false teachers. And down through the centuries, the church has developed statements of faith. Creeds, which most Christians 
adhere to. Might be some slight differences, but down through the centuries, there have been different bodies of faith or statements of faith, going right back to what was known as the Apostles' Creed, which is one of the earliest statements of faith. But there have been many. Since then, there have been the Nicocene Creed, the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Cutchism, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Baptist Confession of Faith. And if you go onto Elim website, you'll see a statement of our fundamental truths, which we, as a body of believers, are covenanted to agree with. If you're a member of the church, you should accept the fundamental truths of the Elim Church. And I said all of these confessions of faith down through the centuries have helped keep the fundamental truths of the Christian faith. There's slight differences between some of them, but basically they all say very similar things. And Christians are down through the centuries have defended those beliefs against error. It's enabled them to spot false teachers. And we are called upon to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And it's important to know what you believe. Important to know what you believe. You need to go, if you haven't already, you need to go to the healing website and read what we believe. Read some of these confessions. Because they tell us central truths about Christianity, about Jesus, about God, about the way of salvation. And so, we come to the end of this first study. We've looked at the importance of faith. We've looked at the um, definition. We've looked at the object of faith. We've looked at the origin of faith. And we've looked at a body of belief, fundamental truths, that we as Christians need to believe. Faith is vital. Faith is vital. And next week, I want to look at the most basic element of faith, and that is saving faith. Saving faith. But I've come to the end of my study. don't know if anyone's got any questions. You can, you can ask questions, but there's one rule. You, want to ask, you only, can only ask questions that I know the answer to. Because <laughs> that makes me look intelligent. <laughs> there's no questions? Then we'll just close in prayer. Lord, we ask that you would grant to each one of us more faith. Lord, we pray for an increase in our faith. We pray that you'll grant to us great faith that we might be able to do mighty exploits for you. Lord, we want to see people saved. We want to see people healed. We want to see people moving on with you. We want people to be moving in the gifts of the Spirit and in the fruits of the Spirit. So we ask, O oh God, that as we continue to look at this subject of faith, this vital subject of faith, that you will grow our faith that our faith will become stronger, that we'll know what we believe, Lord, and we'll be able to stand against all error and false doctrine. We ask, O oh God, that you'll keep us close to the truth. Lord, help us to avoid errors in our own theology and thinking, and help us, Lord, to know your truth, because it's the truth that will set us free. Amen. Thank you for coming.